Can you hear me now? There we go. <laughs> we good? Well, happy Sunday. I think uh, the last couple of Sundays I've been preaching, they've all been holidays, and this one isn't an official holiday, so, well, wait, it is. It's happy Sunday, because anytime we're in the house of the Lord, it's a holiday, because we get to celebrate. So today I want to finish up the series on uh, who am I? The eternal question of uh, who, who really am I? Or sometimes we rephrase it as, do I have any worth? Um, but I want you to know that I actually started this series at the end of the series. And have worked my way to the beginning. You see, in the end we get that holy root that feeds and nourishes us. And it gives us all that we need as long as, you know, we don't strangle and cut ourselves off from it. Um, Romans eleven sixteen 16b, if you remember, it says, if the root is holy, so are the branches. And then in 17, it says, you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Well, that's, that's really the end. A whole lot has to happen before we get that root. And so I kind of moved into the middle of the series. Um, this is still going backwards because we discovered that we are somebodies. Though the world will often tell us we're nobodies, we are somebodies. We are important people. We are important people. Not to the world. And maybe not even to the people who are closest to us. But we are important people to God. 1 Peter 2.9 tells us you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We, we are a chosen people. We are royalty, holy nation, specially chosen by God. That is who I am. And you would almost think that the series could have or should have ended there. But it's, it was just the middle. And last week I continued with the message to fathers, which I think was needed. But you know what? Even though that was to fathers, two of the three points are valid for everyone that's a Christian. First, if you're a Christian, you are worthy. You are worthy because God declares that you are worthy. And second, you are loved. Second Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17 says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. And because of that, we take hope and encouragement despite what the world says despite what's going on in the world we grasp onto that and it gives us encouragement it spurs us on to do good things when the world says we can do nothing so if i have a holy root and i am somebody to god and i am a worthy person and loved you might say, Jerry, do you have any other parts to this series? Why do you call that the middle? Because it is. Today's sermon answers the question, who am I? And thus the title. So I have a big revelation for you. And it's going to shock you completely. I know it is. I have the answer to who am I. That's not the shocking part. Of course, I'm preaching. I've got the answer. But you also have the answer. That's the shocking part. The world has an identity crisis, and we often fall into the trap it sets. Because we forget that when we ask who am I, that we already have the answer. You and I just keep forgetting. 
So turn with me to the book of Romans. Let's look at the book of Romans. We're going to find our answers. Book of Romans chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 19 through 13. Got your app, get it warmed up. There we go. Romans chapter 10, 9 through 13 says, I'm going to have to get a bigger print Bible. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raises him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who am I? I am saved. More importantly for you, you are saved. Let that sink back into you. Ask yourself that question in your head and then answer it. Who am I? I am saved. Look, if you're not saved, you can be. It tells you right there in the scripture, you know, come talk to me after the sermon. Talk to, to another mature Christian. Um, if you're watching on Facebook, message. Because you need that answer. You need to be able to answer the question, who am I, with I am saved. For us who are saved at one time, that was no little thing. We took it seriously. It meant something to us. It meant everything to us. I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but I can almost guarantee some of us broke down and cried when it happened. Colossians 1, 19 to 22 says, For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your mind because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. You are saved. You are blood bought. You are redeemed. You are reconciled to God. You get to spend eternity with God. That, that is where this series should start and end. Which is why I went backwards. That is where it all starts. You accepted Christ's sacrifice. You accepted God's grace and mercy. You were baptized and accepted the gift of the Holy Spirit. You were and are saved. The problem is, we forget. We let the world get a hold of us, and we forget. It should not make us feel any better that just like the identity crisis we go through, forgetting salvation is not new. Paul tells the Ephesians back in Ephesians 2, 11 through 13, Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. 
Paul is reminding the church in Ephesus that they were lost but are saved, bought by the blood of Jesus Christ, just like us. You see, unfortunately, we forget that we are saved sometimes and what it means. We forget that the world and Satan do not control us anymore. The world often does not even know that we are saved. I don't normally wear a t-shirt to preach in. I mean, obviously I also don't wear a shirt and tie, but I'm usually not this informal. But this one was just too perfect for today's sermon. Because you know, Dawn found this online someplace and, and she thought I needed it, so she got it for me. Um, and if you can't read it, it says, I am a pastor. Don't look so surprised. Well, you see, the world does not know just by looking at us that we are Christians, that we are saved. The world does not know that we are different, not by just looking at us, and often not by hanging out with us, because we forget. We do the day-to-day, -day, and the world says, hey, that should do, you're good, go ahead, beautiful. We follow the world and we let it shape us, and we let it shape what we think about who we are. And we're warned about this. God is so great. He tells us ahead of time. You guys are going to mess up. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul is telling the Romans and us that they need to be transformed in the renewing of their mind. That's a constant thing. And not falling into the worldly ways. So do we. Look, so do we. You need to re-find your identity in Christ. When you ask, who am I? And truly, you should ask that question often just to remind yourself that the answer is, I am a saved child of God. Galatians 3, 25 through 27. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. If you, through faith, have accepted Christ, you are saved. And it is because you are saved that you are a child of God. This is no small matter, people. Listen to me. Being a child of God is no small matter. Listen to the Apostle John telling us in 1 John 3, 1 through 2. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is where we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We are children of God. Let that sink in. We are children of God. We're not his first. We are the children of God just as Jesus was and is. And when Christ appears, we shall be like him. Just as he is the son of God and he will come in glory. We are children of God and we shall be in glory. John tells us that and Paul affirms it. Romans 8, 15 to 17. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. 
if indeed we share in his suffering in order that we also share in his glory. We have been adopted into sonship. We are co-heirs with Christ. That is so sweet. Look, this, this, this adoption, this co-heirs, it comes with two things. And we got to remember this also. One, it comes with suffering. Just as Christ suffered, would you let the world know you are a Christian? Not just by words, but by your deeds. Christ suffered. We are going to suffer. It's going to happen. Jesus tells the disciples and us in John 15, 18 through 20, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute, persecute you also. You are a servant. And your master was persecuted and suffered. So how can you not expect that to happen to you? Now, I, I, I know that, that a lot of times especially here in America, we go, hmm, nah, I've read the stories about the persecuted, about the suffering saints, but it doesn't really happen here. Well, maybe you ain't doing it right. Maybe you're not doing it right, that being a servant of Christ. Because listen, it does happen. It happens right here. I'm going to give you a, just a really small, easy example that hits close to home. Look at the pastors in the church. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Look at the pastors in the church. When people find out that we are pastors, they all of a sudden become critical. Sometimes even from other Christians. The judgment comes fast and furious at us. That's why this shirt is perfect for today. If you are a pastor, how come you don't act like one? If you are a pastor, then your life must be perfect. But I see you, and I know that your life isn't. If you are a pastor, how come you hang out with such and such? Why do you hang out with those people? If you are a pastor, how come you watch R-rated movies? How come you read action novels? instead of the Bible. If you are a pastor, then why did I hear a cuss word come out of your mouth? How come you helped that person and not this person? I'm just going to go sit down now. <laughs> well, if you know the pastors in the church, then you know we act like one. We are the pastors, and our lives are not perfect. The problem is the outside world does not know Jesus and thus does not know us. They don't know what we as Christians should act like. Now, you know us. None of us pastors hold the title as who we are. Pastor is a calling that God has placed upon us. And that we accept it. And yes, sometimes we mess it up. And that is our calling. And it's going to happen. The truth is, we are Christians. Just like you. We are saved. We are children of God. And so we act just like a Christian should act. We study the Bible. We do small group. We pay attention to sermons. Ron's usually down front, now he's over here with his family, which I think is fantastic, but it messes up my sermon line. Thanks, I appreciate that. Because it says, Ron's down front taking notes right now. No, he's over here taking notes, it's okay. We study the Bible, we do small group, we pay attention to sermons, we take notes during church. We spend time with God. We spend quiet times. We help others in the church and we help those that aren't in the church. 
I cannot tell you how many phone calls for help we have answered. Just like other Christians. See, I think this, this t-shirt really should just say, I am a Christian, might look so surprised. You see, we do all of that. Sorry, boys, for pointing you out. And it's about to get worse because, you see, your pastors, like other Christians, we stumble, we fall, we make mistakes. We hope that people don't see those mistakes, those stumbles, those falls. If you are a Christian, does that not sound like you? I hope. I can say without heavy hesitation that every one of your pastors have stumbled and fell, and often. I can also say without hesitation that what gives us strength to keep going is the fact that we know that we have sonship. We know that God sees us and loves us, and it's not about being perfect. It is about continually trying to be better, to do more, to be closer to God, to walk closer with our brother Jesus. Because just like the prodigal son, the f talked about him on the Father's Day sermon, we know we are accepted and forgiven and loved by our Father. And you should be the same. Because you are no different than us. You see, if we are children, if we are children of Christ, and we're faithful in our servanthood to him, then we are going to suffer. But we will also share in his glory. We will share in his glory. Listen, there are a lot of verses that I could have picked out for this. This one was easy. God goes, pick one. But I really, really like this one. John 14, 2 through 3. Jesus is telling them, my Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me that you also may be where I am. What more glory can we share in than to have a room in heaven. That is glory. We have a place in God's house. This is a body. This is the world. I have a place in God's house. So do you. Think about that. I really want to end the sermon right here. I want to end it now. Because that is a high note and it is all that we need. We are children of God. We are saved. Sorry, PowerPoint guys, because none of this is in my sermon, but it is what it is. We are children of God. We are saved, and we have a place in God's house in heaven forever. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Janice said amen again. <sighs> but I can't. I can't end it here. Because you see, you are a child of God, and you have a home in heaven with Jesus, and you have all the glory you cannot even withstand. But with that, I have to give you a warning. I have to. You see, there is a problem with being called a child of God. The problem is sometimes we believe it. We believe that we are a child of God. And sometimes we embrace it. The child part, that is. Because a child wants to do what a child wants to do. They do not want to study and do the things that adults or mature Christians tell them they should be doing. They don't want to do quiet times or serve in ministry. And I wish that that was a new problem that we just invented. But Paul addresses this very problem to the Corinthian church. 
1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3, he says, Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Paul tells them they are still infants, only taking milk and not eating solid food. That he cannot give them solid food still because they are still embracing the child part. He's admonishing them for embracing the world and not growing in Christ. Yes, we are children of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus, but we are not meant to remain infants. I am a child of my parents, but I do not act like a child. I have grown and matured. We are called to do the same thing as children of God. We are called to maturity, not to stay as an infant. Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. So Christ gave himself the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for work of service to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Look, look there, become mature, become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We are called to stop being infants and mature up and grasp that fullness. Paul goes on to tell us in 14, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Satan, Satan will be perfectly happy if all you do, Satan will be perfectly happy if all you do is to show up for church on Sunday. Sitting in a pew, Satan got no problem with that. Satan will be perfectly happy if you stay an infant and even fall away from the church. And Satan will be happy if milk is all you want. So the question is, are you going to embrace your infancy or grow in maturity do you have daily quiet time are you reading and studying your Bible are you in a small group are you serving God in a ministry or are you showing up on Sunday and feeling that is enough second Peter 1 5 through 8 make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measures, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter is telling us we need to be growing as Christians. We need to be growing in Christ. We need to be growing in understanding of what God has done for us and what we should be doing as his servants. Look at those verses. Goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, mutual affection, and love. Don't fool yourself and say, well, I have all that. You don't see what I do at home. It's not about what I see. I'm not judging. It's not my job. It's not about what I see. It's about what he sees. But he does talk about the fruits of the Spirit. Just saying. Now, James backs Peter up. James 2, 17 says, In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. God wants your faith. God wants your faith. But faith without action is a dead faith. It is an infant faith. God calls us to so much more. We are called to action, 
both in personal growth and in doing service for the Lord. Admonition is over. The series about answering the question, who am I? The answer is, I am a blood-bought, redeemed child of God. I am saved. I am a holy child of God. I am a a flawed believer who is growing through the power of the Holy Spirit that feeds me daily. He feeds me through my studies and my prayers and my serving of the Lord. That's who I am. How do you answer the question? How do you answer that question? Who am I? Should be, hopefully, the same way. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for adopting me. Thank you for taking me in. Thank you for redeeming me. And thank you for redeeming the other Christians that are here. Bless you, Father, for all that you are. Thank you, Father, for blessing us. I just ask that you continue to bless us and let us grow into maturity. Let us stop being afraid of being a Christian and the suffering that might come with us. Let us serve you. Let us serve you by growing in you. Because the more I know, the more I want to do. Lord, I just ask that you continue to bless us this week and that we take your word out into the world and that the world sees that light. Father, it is so wonderful to be your child because there are so many blessings that come with it. For it's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen.